right. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Um, my name is Funny. My first name is Jay. You can really call me Jay. You'll get used to it. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. I'm going to tell you just a few moments about Fresh Energy, which is the wonderful organization. I will soon be the longest serving staff member of. <laughs> I'll tell you about that in a minute. Fresh Energy is online. If you like any of the stories I tell you, there are a thousand more of them at fresh-energy.org. We're 30 years old. We're a Minnesota-based, nonpartisan, nonprofit climate and energy organization that is working to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. Here's what distinguishes us. We are bold, all of us are smart, and we are also very practical. And we are pulling to advance climate and energy policy. We say we're always looking around at what we can do. We're looking to find the highest lever we can pull. We can in any way pull and pull it with all of our strength. So that's a big job. And I'm going to tell you three stories, and in between, <coughs> Pat's going to tell you three different stories. And they are all really about communication and about changing things to move forward on climate action locally or very broadly. All right. So I'm going to use three stories. And my first story is, I was, first of all, I want people here who support fresh energy or work for fresh energy. All right. There's a lot of you here. Thank you. Um, I was the first person hired by my current boss, Michael Noble. And there he is. Um, and he knew that he was pulling me from academia. So I had a great job. I was working for the George Washington University. I was teaching excellent graduate students and undergrads, and I loved it. But I was ready to come back to Minnesota because it was in my mind that the politics of Minnesota, and this was in 1995, was maybe changing enough that the state could move forward with clean energy. It turns out I was right. Um, but the first thing I promised Michael when I started the job was that every day I was at work, I was going to be talking every day about global warming and climate change and solutions to this. And I've been true to that. Um, so my first story is about, I'm calling it On the Road. And this is how I got used to telling the global warming story across Minnesota. And one of the things was I was at the legislature a lot, talking about climate change. And it was really a tough thing to do, to talk about it in 1995 in Minnesota. And when I wrote the first um, about 12-page booklet about called Playing with Fire, Global Warming in Minnesota, I had three versions of that. They came out in 1991. 1997, and 2001. And we gave them away for free to tens of thousands of Minnesotans. So that was one way to get the word out. But then, out of the blue, one day I got a call at my office. And the call was coming to me from a polar explorer named Will Steger. <laughs> now, I met him before, but he didn't remember it. I met him at the state fair, and there's a picture of me with Will Steger. <laughs> but he was calling me up because he was very worried about this chaotic problem of climate change, and he really wanted to do a better job of going out and talking to people about it. And he'd heard about me, and he knew that I was a person who got things done. So we talked for a while, and he figured <laughs> out that we would go on the road with a joint set of presentations. And I'll tell you, the first presentation we gave was a part of Minnesota I'd never been in. Morris, Minnesota, a great little town. And it was a small place, but it was the best, better, biggest audience that I'd ever seen in Minnesota. 
300 people for three hours. <coughs> and so <coughs> I will tell you one thing we gave to everyone in our audience, because this is my take on this. We weren't just giving a free show to people. We were at assemble 300 people in a very small town in Minnesota to think about global warming for three hours. And we left them postcards that looked like this and directed to people like Governor Dayton or Congressman then at the time, Tim Walz, okay? Or to Senator Amy Klobuchar. And they all told the person what the person signing this postcard wanted that elected person to do. So, after that night, we had a very great night. But I decided a number of things. I decided, well, we're going to get really bigger than that. Because we had like 20, 20 venues set up. And so, what I did was to say, someone had given me this postcard. And I always created a new postcard for the new event pertinent to that locality and to what was really going on. Where were the decisions being made? So I knew that I had to get great postcards. And I know I had to use those postcards. And I told the people in my audiences. And the most common audience was 1,000 people. And I talked to groups of 1,000 people in about 250 communities across Minnesota and into South Dakota, North Dakota. I was on North Dakota Public Radio for an hour with Will Steger, telling North Dakotans they had to stop burning coal. And then I talked in Winnipeg, and I talked in Milwaukee, Minnesota, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I talked in Des Moines, and then I talked all over the country with Will Steger and without Will Steger. And I always told the people I was going to deliver the signed postcards within a few days to the elected official. And I did bring these, those to people and told them the whole story about this event. And I mentioned there were a thousand people there and, the, and named some of the people who were there because it was their hometown too. And the typical audience, 85% of people signed the postcards and I delivered them. Pat has seen my boxes of postcards that I came home with. Huge boxes. So, um, the whole, total number of people we reached in the, the few years that Will and I worked together was about 250,000 Minnesotans. And we spoke in a lot of towns except not Thief River Falls, Minnesota. Every other one. Um, we spoke in all the top 30 largest cities. And outside the box, the communities that did the best job for putting on a really big event for us were from number one, Edina, Minnesota, number two, Eden Prairie, Minnesota, number three, Rochester, Minnesota. And at every event, I invited a local group because I wanted the hyper-local group where everyone looking around would recognize the environmentalists from there. I also invited all the media, TV, radio, newspapers. We were on all of those. We invited the mayor, who always came to our event, city council members, the League of Women Voters. We invited all the utilities, especially the CEOs, and they all came. And they got to speak at many events. I invited speakers from faith leaders, like archbishops and bishops from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and every other church in Minnesota, and every other synagogue in Minnesota. I invited all the business leaders, and they all came. Even the guy from Dairy Queen brought dilly bars for everyone. <laughs> he was totally into it. I invited the biggest high school group, and guess who this was in the dining? The biggest high school student group 
was the environmental group. So I invited all the college leaders, invited Rotary Club members, all of them came. And examples of these cards we delivered to people. We made a delivery to Senator Amy Klobuchar that changed the world. Ask me during the Q&A to tell you that, and I'll tell you that story. <coughs> we asked Senator Norm Coleman to do something, and he was before Senator Amy Klobuchar in being the author of the Climate Change Bill. Senator Norm Coleman. We also asked Representative um, Tim Walls, before he was governor, to do things. And we asked Governor Tim Pawlenty to do a lot of things too, and he did those too. So think about that. Think about what that took to get those meetings in roughly 250 towns or cities. And I'll tell you one last thing about that. When I got to Edina, I walked into a church with 1,100 people in it, right across the street from the high school. And who came up to me but the Republican senator from Edina, who I knew a little bit from the legislature. He came right up to me and he said, he put his hand around me and wanted to get his Facebook photo taken with me. <coughs> and he said, Jay, you've done a great job. Anyone who's anyone in this town is here tonight. And that's what got those, folk, those postcards responded to. And now I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you, Jay. So while Jay was cumulatively adding up thousands of miles of traveling back and forth across Minnesota, my task in the early 2000s was doing something right outside the back door of the Science Museum in Minnesota. We were relatively new into our, our building on the riverfront, and we were always charged with leading a team to create the museum's first outdoor science park, which came to be known as the Big Backyard. But before we could create the Big Backyard, we needed to create a structure that would serve as the headquarters for that outdoor science park. And so what we decided to do was pursue building better buildings. And the reason for that is that because this is true now, this was true 20 years ago, when you look at residential scale buildings in the United States, they're about responsible for about 22% of all the energy use in the United States, and therefore, about a comparable amount of the greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change. Buildings sit silently on our landscape and quietly consume huge amounts of energy that are driving climate change. So as we start to think about this building that would serve as the headquarters for an outdoor space that actually would be an outdoor environmental demonstration and exhibit space, we thought, well, the building should be an exhibit in its own right. The building should test a hypothesis. And so the hypothesis that me and the architects and the engineers came up with was, is it possible to design, construct, and operate a building in Minnesota's <coughs> extreme climate of long cold winters and short hot summers that can actually produce as much energy as it uses on an annual basis. So the outcome was this building called Science House, a separate freestanding building on the campus of the Science Museum in Minnesota. We call it a house even though no one lives in it because it has a scale of a, of a house. It has the functionality of a house. And it's pretty subtle, and it was intended to be so, but all the roof surfaces actually make solar electricity. And so we modeled this building, kept track of the results of this building over a number of years, and actually did test and prove the hypothesis, which is that it is possible 20 years ago, with off-the-shelf technology, to design, construct a residential scale building that could produce as much energy as it uses on an annual basis. Several years later, the interior of Science House was remodeled to serve as a teacher resource center, <coughs> in particular a place in the summertime where teachers and educators would come to take enrichment courses on a wide variety of topics. <coughs> every 
course began with an orientation of the fact of here's this unusual building that you were <coughs> taking your course in. So people ask me nowadays, so looking back 20 years on the construction of Science House, what's different now than 20 years ago? And my answer is, this building would be much cheaper today than 20 years ago because there's been an astonishing reduction in the cost of solar voltaics. In large parts of the world, generating electricity from the sun is the least cost, uh, cost um, effective way, it is the most cost effective way of generating electricity. And that has been a transformational change in how we produce electricity in the United States and around the world. And I'll hand it off to Jay for story number two. Story number two is called Winning the Regulatory Fight. Now, I've mentioned to you delivering some of those signed postcards to every legislator in our legislature. 201 of them. Yeah, they all got postcards. And we spent a lot of time, and I'm going to talk a little later about the legislature, because I have to tell you that we in 2023 have had our best legislative session and fresh energy. Please. <laughs> not in session. And the legislature is the ones who, if we're lucky, passes bills and makes them laws. Does what we want to do, <coughs> but not always. But um, there is another regulatory body, and it is called the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. Five people serve on it. They're all appointed by different presidents, uh, different uh, governors, and there can never be more than three of them from any one political party. And they have staggered terms. They each work for six years at a time. They are regulators of, among other things, electricity and natural gas. And they take the laws from the legislature and implement these laws. And they need to make sure that every utility, the investor-owned utility, doing what the laws say. So they have different, different provinces. And the thing that is in the legislation that specifies what the PUC does is that they are very interested in ensuring that energy stay affordable <coughs> and reliable. You can probably guess why we agree with that. Energy has to be affordable and reliable. But they also have a third realm, and that is the PUC must be sure that every investor-owned utility in the state meets every environmental law written in Minnesota or passed in Congress. Now that's a very different job. Okay. So here's where we come in. Not so many years ago, <coughs> not very many years ago at all, the second largest investor-owned utility in the state, Minnesota Power, was getting 95% of your electrons, if you lived up there or had a cabin up there, 95% of their electrons came from burning coal. And that's the number one source of carbon dioxide. And other utilities, like the largest utility, XL Energy, which provides my energy, um, it was still burning coal in a lot of different places. <coughs> and the only way to get them to think and to get the PUC to do what we wanted them to do, which was to do something we really couldn't do yet, because Every two years, the utilities come to the PUC and they present to them a 15-year business plan telling everyone how they intend to provide power to their existing customers and their new customers and how to show the 
Utility has to show how that's the lowest cost thing they can do. The lowest cost thing. Well, these big utilities, they use models to do this. You know, I can look around, but I know there's a lot of people who use models in their daily work. These are economic models. And um, the utilities own the models. They bought a copy of the model. So they have it at their disposal 365 days a year, 24 7 day, hours a day. We did not have access to this model. Now, the model at the time was very expensive. And at the time, we were a much smaller organization than Fresh Energy now is. We didn't have any kind of budget item for this. And we felt like if we can't go against or working to educate the PUC about how much burning coal really costs their customers. Without doing that, without using the same models, we were losing out. And so, I did a number of things at that time. I was going to a training at NYU's law school, and it was to teach people about using these models. And the first person I met was an economist who was about 10 years younger than me. <clears throat> and she was starting in her own business. And her business was running the same models that the utilities run. So I became very friendly with her. <laughs> and I asked her how much it would cost, whether we could even get access to that license for a short time much time it would take her to run the models for, say, the largest utility in Minnesota and see if they were making the right assumptions, if they were making bold enough, aggressive enough assumptions about what was going to happen to wind and solar and battery power. <clears throat> because we were watching those and the bottom was falling out of those prices. And we thought, that their modeling, which we couldn't see now, because we didn't have the model. So what Anna told me was, well, I think it's a constrained enough business plan that I could do the modeling in about three months. And so I got sent off, I sent off myself, to call up the owners of the model. And I said, I would like to buy a temporary license to the model, and I am a nonprofit. Well, he didn't really like hearing that word very much, because he tried to convince me to buy the whole model and to buy it forever, which would have been enormously expensive. So we had several conversations, and finally, I talked him down. How much would the cost be for a nonprofit? to have access to the model for 90 days. And he came back at me and he said, well, you have to run it only on one laptop, and the laptop has to be given to your analyst and then taken back from her after 90 days are off. So I had a timeline on me. And then I needed to find $25,000, <laughs> because that's what the model costs for three months. So I went to some of our funders and found a funder who hadn't funded this kind of work, putting nonprofits in a position there they could run at pace with a utility to try to prove, using the model, that what the utility was proposing was too expensive and wasn't being aggressive enough with the assumption. And so I got access to $25,000. And then the first problem was, Anna was living in a small, remote town in upstate New York. And I had to find her a brand new laptop and send it to her. And then she told me, oh, by the way, I live in the downtown. And I work from my office. But a lot of FedEx guys can't find my office. So that computer got to Anna three days late. 
In other words, when the license started three days earlier. That meant I had to get back on the phone with the salesman and squeeze another three days out of him because it was FedEx's fault. And what Anna came out with, working closely with Fresh Energy and with many other partners who were working with the PUC, and we were giving Anna the charge of being very aggressive in our assumptions and lay them all out. And what Anna came up with was that the future that the utility was proposing to the PUC was more expensive than relying more, especially on more wind power. Because at the time, about 95% of the coal plants in the country were running at a loss. At a loss. They weren't making any money. But wind power and now solar energy can often undercut that. So that was a huge advantage for me. And since then, the same funder has now expanded this possibility of using the models to many other nonprofits around the country. And by the way, another thing happened. The salesman, it was a little bit snarky with me occasionally, because I was from a nonprofit. He said, he called me up and said, oh, by the way, we're going to stop making that model, because the utilities have decided they want a cheaper model. <laughs> <laughs> so now many more nonprofits can get it. And now I want to show you what this has done. <clears throat> In that, in that community of um, those utility people. Now I use this, this question to some of my presentations. In 2035, I asked people what percentage of electricity in Minnesota is forecast to be generated from burning coal. If you don't know this, you should know it's D. It will be 0% coal. In fact, Excel will get 0% coal as of the end of 2030. That is an utter giant change in the positive for all of us trying to work, work on climate change. Next, I'll turn it back to Matt. I want to reinforce that message because that is a transformational change in how we generate electricity. Electricity used to be our dirtiest form of energy, and it is now becoming the cleanest, most versatile form of energy. And therefore, we need to vastly expand how we use electricity. We need to electrify our economy, our transportation, but especially, I say, in our buildings. And I'm gonna use the Science Museum of Minnesota as an example of how we are transforming our buildings. Now, I'm proud of Science House as a model of how to design and construct a new building that advances our thinking about how buildings can reduce their environmental impact. But candidly, we're not going to build our way out of the climate change problem because there are over 100 million buildings in the United States. So we need to radically transform and retrofit existing buildings. And commercial buildings, like the Science Museum, commercial institutional buildings are, you know, 18% of the use of electricity and energy in the United States. So, huge source of greenhouse gas emissions. So, a quick story about the Science Museum. It starts back in August of 2008, when I got a call from this guy. Scott Gibney, at that time, he was a key account manager at Excel Energy. His job was to sell Excel Energy's energy efficiency programs to some of its biggest customers. But he had always kept the Science Museum in his portfolio, small though we were in comparison to his clients, because he liked working with us on energy education projects. And the phone rang on my desk. Remember when there was a phone on your desk and you would pick up the receiver? And it was Scott on the other end, and he said, I want to introduce you to someone, someone who's achieving remarkable feats of energy efficiency. So a meeting was set up at the Science Museum in Minnesota with this guy. 
fellow by the name of Dave Soberg, at that time a one-man mechanical engineering consulting shop in South Minneapolis. And I was perplexed and amazed. How did this one person manage to gain the attention of one of the biggest utilities in the United States? And he told us the story. Our large, modern, commercial, institutional buildings, they use enormous amounts of electricity. <coughs> and electricity inevitably degrades into heat. So these buildings produce enormous amounts of heat. And the heat has to be managed, otherwise the interiors, this space that we're in right now, would quickly become uninhabitable. So, how do we manage that heat? We throw it away, we expel it, we get rid of it as quickly and easily as possible. And then we use other forms of energy to do the work that could have been done with the heat energy that we just threw away. So intrigued, we contracted with Dave Silberg to do a top to bottom energy analysis of the Science Museum way back in 2010. Several months later, he came back with a thick report, but there was a couple of top of line messages. One of them is he said, at the time, the Science Museum was using 6.5 million kilowatt hours of electricity annually, which candidly meant nothing to me. I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a facility manager, but both Jay and I are trained as geographers. So I put that into a context so that I could understand. At that time, the Science Museum in Minnesota, one building was using as much electricity as all 300 households in this 18 block area of St. Paul. And Dave went on and said, so all that electricity coursing through the Science Museum, it degrades into over 20 billion BTUs of heat energy. And we shrugged our shoulders and said, well, it sounds like a large number. <laughs> and he said, and it is. And you are expelling that heat energy from the building. And we said, yeah, because that's how commercial institutional buildings in the United States are designed, constructed, and operated. He said, but you're, you're buying 15 billion BTUs of heat energy annually. Why are you throwing away an enormous amount of heat and then turning around and buying an enormous amount? And we said, well, because no one had ever, ever laid out that ridiculous situation to us before. <laughs> so we followed up on his recommendation to install two of these machines called heat recovery chillers. A fancy name for a large commercial machine that is a heat pump that moves heat energy from one place to another. So here's your second and final multiple choice question of the evening. The Science Museum in Minnesota has reduced its purchases of hot water by how much through its advanced heat recovery and retrofit and upgraded building automation system? A, 25%, B, 33%, C, 50 or D, 60 Well, I think you know by now that the answer is always the last one. <laughs> That's right, 60% reduction in our use of hot water. Now, Dave Soberg said, now candidly, heat recovery chillers, they run on electricity. So your electricity use will probably go up a little bit. But it'll be worth it because of the dramatic reduction in your use of hot water to heat the building. But that has not been our experience. Our use of electricity has plummeted over the intervening years because of other cost-effective, energy-efficient improvements that we have made to the building. But you have to spend money in order to save energy and therefore to save money. And we spent a lot of money. We spent $900,000 on this retrofit of the Science Museum. <clears throat> but we're saving $150,000 a year for a simple payback of six years, which makes Alison Brown, the president of the Science Museum in Minnesota, a happy camper. Because that's $150,000 every year that can go to the scientific and educational mission of the Science Museum instead of paying utility bills. But there are broader implications to that because Doing that retrofit, we helped employ the factory workers down in La Crosse, Wisconsin, who built the heat recovery chillers, the truckers that delivered them to St. Paul, the riggers that took them off the truck and carefully maneuvered them into the science museum, the concrete workers, the electricians, the pipe fitters, the software technicians, and many other skilled tradespeople to retrofit one building. Imagine the economic, employment, equity, education, and environmental benefits if energy efficient buildings in the United States weren't rare <clears throat> but commonplace.
but I want to remind you of all of those postcards I collected for years and delivered to elected officials. A number of those postcards, it turned out, when I was carrying them through the legislature, legislature to get to someone's office, I read the name on the signature. And often, it was the wife of the legislator I was going to visit. <laughs> His wife had been to the event in her town where her husband had spoken. And she had signed a letter to her husband. More than one woman did this. More than one man did this, too. And it was because those people were listening closely <coughs> at Will Steger, and I called him the eyewitness to global warming. Now, of course, we are all global witnesses, environmental witnesses to this. But um, they listened to me, too, because they saw me, and they came up to me, and they called me up afterwards, and they said, I was impressed at how practical you were. Now, what the person meant was that I wasn't a green bean environmentalist, that I used numbers and analysis and was careful to go head to head with the same dramatic tools that the utility was using to make the case for those five members of the Public Utilities Commission that you shouldn't just accept what the utilities modeler gets out of the model. Mm -hmm. That you have to look much <coughs> deeper than that. And that we had always brought a very good case. And we often won. But the next part is about really winning. And it is why, because I've been expecting these, these laws to pass. They are now law. They are federal laws and Minnesota laws. I've been waiting for them for about three years, and I was sure they were coming. And it is why my level of optimism about solving the climate action problem is something we can do. So I'm going to start out with some of the very good news, and then give you some of the background to it, and then tell you what has to happen. This is called the journey to 100% carbon-free energy. <coughs> now you're smart people, you maybe read the papers. This was on the front page of every paper in Minnesota, and most, many of them in other parts of the country. On February 7th, 2023, when Governor Tim Walz signed this bill into law. And I would let you know that he told everyone who was listening when he was reelected, he had one top priority for 2023. He wanted Minnesota to pass a law to make sure that 100% of our energy across the state was carbon free by 2040. Who told him to do this? His own Minnesota Climate Change Advisory Council. 16 members had come up with this as the number one thing that Minnesota should do. And he signed this on February 7th. Now I know Colorado has just signed a similar law to get to 100% carbon free energy, but it is happening by 2050. Mm. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I love Colorado too. And they have the same major utility that we have, Excel. But they need to work a little harder <laughs> because we've shown them the way now. So this is what the bill looks like. It says it has to happen by 2040, and it sets a new renewable energy standard which was first passed in like 2001, and said something like, well, utilities should try really hard <laughs> to get something as as big as like 10% of their electricity from renewable energy. That's how lame we were back then, because that was what we had the possibility to pass. 
But now, the Renewable Energy Standard says <coughs> that by 2035, 55% of our electricity has to come from renewable energy. And on top of that, by 2030, 80% of all the big utilities have to get carbon free by 2030. Now, you might ask, as some people asked in committee meetings, how do we know that they can get to 80% carbon free in just seven years? Remember I talked to you before about Excel Energy. Because Excel Energy is someone, some set of distinct human beings that we have worked with as human beings. And my boss, and sometimes I, go to lunch with the CEO of Excel, the former CEO. And we went to him, and we initially suggested to him, why don't we get together four times a year and have a lunch or a breakfast and get to learn about each other? We think you probably wonder about who the heck is this fresh energy? And we often wonder, how do they make their decisions? And so we started talking about things like that. And when Michael and I started doing that, we were looking at just a conjecture that if we found out that we had the same core values as a big company, like 50% of the same core values, well, if we found we had that type of agreement, we could start doing projects with that company. Because we do not look for <coughs> purists. We don't think there are any purists. We don't think the goal of our jobs is to find everyone who's exactly like us. How boring would that be? How stupid would that be? You're not using all the talents around you. So, um, what Excel had done did you know this? I found this out in 2019. Some of you know that I was in the hospital in early 2019, and I almost died from falling on the ice. But I didn't die. <laughs> and the first thing I did was to go back to work full time on May 1. And on about May 8, I went to the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, because I like to hear what they're talking about. And they were having an open meeting and guess who was there? The then CEO of Excel Energy was there. And his name is Ben Polk. He's since retired. And by the way, if your kids or grandkids ever asked you, how does a person get to be the CEO of a big utility? What do they major in in college? You know what he majored in? Accounting! <laughs> and that's a good thing for a utility executive to to understand, because that's what he has to do, show the money. Um, but, so what happened is, um, what he was saying to the PUC, he was coming out with a big statement, and I was sitting there on Twitter, and what he said was, Excel Energy in Minnesota has decided that everyone in Minnesota will have 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050. So I tweeted that right out. Yeah, I did. <laughs> tweeted that right out. And then he came back to the PUC two weeks later. And at that time, for those two weeks, he had made a statement that was the most forward leadership position of any utility in the country. Saying that all of his customers would <coughs> be able to get 100% carbon free electricity by 2050. But two weeks later, he came back to the PUC, and I was there again. And he said to me, Jay, you're looking great. Thank God you didn't die. <laughs> and then what he said was the really a big announcement. He said to the PUC, we have decided since we sell electricity in eight states between the border of Canada and the border of Mexico, they're the fourth largest utility. And he 
said, we have decided that we are going to make 100% carbon-free electricity available to 100% of our customers by 2050 in eight states. Now, I was tweeting that out too, and a lot of people were tweeting that out. And now, there are almost 100 companies, utility companies in the country, that are making that commitment. But here's the other thing that Excel did after 2019. Because in 2022, they had a decision coming from the PUC. And remember what I said, they were regulators. And when they're looking at a company's 15-year business plan, they can decide to not accept that plan and send them back to do more work. And that officially came up for a vote and Excel had, a few years before 2022, had filed a, their 15-year plan with us and with the PUC. Everyone was looking at it, and we didn't think it was good enough. Because what it said was, well, you know, we said we're going to close our coal plants, and we're still going to do that. But what we're going to do with our biggest coal plant Probably you can buy it on I-94. It's called Sherco 1, 2, and 3. They're all coal plants. And what they said was, we're going to still close all those coal plants. We'll close them. This is beautiful. Sherco 2 closes by December 31st this year. Sherco 1 closes by December 31st, 2027. And the big one, December Circle 3 closes by the end of 2030. That's a win. But here's where they went on and said, what we're planning to do is instead of coal, we're going to build, well, they didn't say this, but it was a honking big natural gas combined cycle, which emits almost as much carbon dioxide as a coal plant. So we sent our best employees talk to himself and say what we intended to model. And after about a year and a half, Excel pulled back that first proposal to the PUC and instead said, we are not going to build any more natural gas. We are going to put a large solar plant on the Sherco site, about 460 megawatts, which will be the biggest in the Midwest. And I was listening when the PUC made the decision on that second proposal. And I heard the big shot lawyer who was representing Excel get up and he said something that I also tweeted out. Because he said, by doing this, we calculate that by 2030, Excel in Minnesota will get 87% carbon-free electricity by 2030. And that is why, based on what Excel has demonstrated, every company in Minnesota can get by, to at least 80% by 2030. And I was tweeting that out, and I was also tweeting it out with messages to all my friends in other states saying, Hey, any friends who lives in any of the other 49 states? Is your largest utility getting 87% carbon-free electricity by 2030? And they were all embarrassed because we were in the lead. So, there's benchmarks in this law that says you have to be 90% carbon-free by 2035, and just five more years, you need to be 100% Every utility ended up supporting this bill because they knew we were right. And everyone was right. And by the way, Governor Walz had started working on this bill when it was to be 100% carbon free by 2050. And he pulled it back, it had to happen by 2040. Because he'd been listening to what President Joe Biden has been saying and has been promising 
195 other countries in the world. He came to Glasgow when Pat and I were there. And what he said was, I am committed to getting 50 to 52% emissions reductions across the economy by 2030 in the US. <coughs> and to get there, you need to get to carbon free sooner, by like 2040 or even earlier. And so this law is the biggest investment, part of the biggest investment in climate action that Minnesota has ever made. It is a big deal. It is remarkable. Tell your kids, tell your grandkids that you're proud of your state for doing this because they're making it a better world for them. Now, on top of that, there was surprisingly some action going on in the last couple of years in Congress. <laughs> Now, I've been watching Congress very, very intimately for the last 15 years, and not much has come out of it. But in 2021, in the fall, Congress passed a bipartisan bill to fund infrastructure, rebuilding roads, rebuilding bridges, building new transmission lines, building fast chargers for electric vehicles all infrastructure. And then we were waiting for the second bill to pass because we'd always heard about it. And the second bill was going to be all about climate programs. And it finally passed and was signed into law by President Biden on August 16, 2022. And it is called the Inflation Reduction it is all about climate change. And it has a marker that tells you that this bill is providing, is setting aside money for rebates and refunds to every household who wants it to buy certain categories of appliances and electric vehicles and weatherization tools for their house and many things that will improve their lives especially in that 40% of the money going out from the federal government must go to improve the lives of BIPOC people who live in overstressed communities who don't have as much as we do and start addressing that. 40% has to go to EG communities. So these are large amounts of money moving by the Inflation Reduction Act, and also some climate funding in the bipartisan infrastructure law. And what did Minnesota do about that? Well, we know what they did in one, one of the session this year. Governor Walz voted for 100% carbon free by 2020. But the other thing, the second thing he signed, and this was, um, April, because the legislature had passed what every state needs to do, because the, the alarmed and very interested in federal money moving out to other states to help them do climate action, they know that they read the fine print of the Congress law and it says, for most of the money, they expect the states to put up something to say that they're involved in this climate action. In other words, there is a little match required from each state. And that means the legislature for each state needs to approve match money. What I hear is now the state of Minnesota has now approved about $115 million of matching money and just increased that by another $100 million. We'll see if this is true tomorrow. I think it is. Because what that extra money does is to make sure that federal money comes faster to states like Minnesota. And that's really, really good news. Now, why do I bring 
below state action. Because on top of that help to draw more federal funds in from the IRA. And by the way, that's a lot of money. Because the IRA says that they will give up, give out to households $370 billion. But now we find it's more than that because more studies have been done. And the latest study shows that about 2.1, so that's really interesting. The other thing that's been going on in the legislature, because I've been watching this, is committees in both houses have passed bills that when they pass them in their committee, they say, if you, pass, if you vote for this bill, it will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus climate and energy bill. And then, what the Senate came up with and what the House came up with are not identical. And if you know that it's basic about civics, when you send a bill to the governor, he's not gonna sign two bills that are voted for and they're different bills. So there were conference committees created. They agreed on the language. And now that bill at 2.15 this afternoon was on the Minnesota House floor. And then they, and then they went on to another bill. I don't know yet what that language is going to look like, but we have seen it and it will pass, and I suggest that you look forward to tomorrow, call up Fresh Energy's website, fresh-energy.org. I think by the end of the today, tomorrow, it will have a blog that's on the front page that will tell you exactly what is in this climate and energy bill, that will then go to Governor Walst for signing it before the end of Monday. And between those two things, what Minnesota has done, Minnesota has now signaled that it will make the largest investment it has ever made, ever made in climate action. And the bills, these two bills that Congress passed, is the biggest thing any country in this world has ever done. So, please don't be global. We now have the money we need to start putting together the solutions to climate action. And most of the technology is already in place. It works in Minnesota. So that is why I'm so happy that is why my two bosses at Fresh Energy have announced that 2023 has been the best legislative year for Fresh Energy and all the people we work with. It's a very large ecosystem. So, that is what's happening. And do you have one more second? So as James pointed out, the race is on to decarbonize our economy. And as Governor Jay Ainsley of Washington State said as we were at the COP27 conference in, in Egypt last November, we now have the tools commensurate to the scale of the problem. And I think one of the opportunities now is how we decarbonize our economy. And in particular, I have been vocal about cultural institutions, museums, really taking the lead on showing what is possible. Because we need visibility in order to create an all-society approach to the climate issue. So just here's a quick recap about where the Science Museum has been. We've been tracking our carbon dioxide emissions. They peaked in early 2014 and through our advanced heat recovery that I described earlier, 
by May of 2019, they'd already dropped by over 40%. In May of 2019, I approached the Science Museum senior leadership team and I said, we ought to adopt carbon neutrality as an institutional initiative. And they agreed, and at that time we said, we will cut our existing 2019 emissions by another 50% 50, 50 by 2030, and our goal is to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And we'll continue to invest in energy efficiency but also we'll partner with our utilities. So, in March of 2021, the Science Museum subscribed to Excel Energy's wind source program so that we could claim that all of our electricity was carbon neutral electricity. Now, we did so fully realizing that when you subscribe to wind source, you pay a little bit more for wind electricity. But we deemed it worth it in order to be able to say that all of the electricity powering the Science Museum of Minnesota was carbon neutral. And we have paid more. But here's what's stunning is that over the most of the months of the last year, wind source electricity has actually been cheaper than the grid energy others have been getting. Driving home the fact that wind energy and solar energy now are becoming some of the most cost effective ways of generating electricity, both in the upper Midwest and around the world. Then in October of 2021, District Energy St. Paul, which supplies the Science Museum with hot water, with chilled water, with steam, announced that all of its chilled water was now carbon neutral. So based on my calculations, by the end of last year, December of 2022, the Science Museum's carbon emissions had already dropped by 90% from their peak in 2014. So, we've set a new goal for ourselves, not to be carbon neutral by 2050, but to be carbon neutral by 2030, seven years from now. And the person who's gonna get us across that finish line is Emily Robin Abbott, the first woman director of facilities of the Science Museum of Minnesota in its 116 year history. And one of the ways that we'll do that is that we are exploring right now the feasibility of putting a large solar array on the rooftop of the Science Museum of Minnesota. Because as Emily and I know and many of you realize, the future of Earth will be decided by human decision making, either by default or by design, either by accident or by intention. So let's imagine, design, and realize the more secure safer climate future that we all want. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be presenting to an audience committed and engaged in doing exactly that. And I want to thank the Minnesota chapter of the Arts Foundation for this deeply appreciated award on behalf of both me and my wife, Jadre Hamilton. Is that all right? Sure. 